Good evening, dear friends and fellow seekers of truth. I am Clyde, your humble Knight Steward, and it is my great honor to welcome you to another enlightening session of the Knights of God live discussion. From the dangers of cults and false teachings, to the imperative of evangelism and the art of apologetics, we explore a wide array of topics that are vital to the strength and integrity of our faith. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I implore you to gather your courage, sharpen your minds, and open your hearts as we embark on another chapter of our journey together. In tonight's live stream, we are hosting part two of the Hebrews 10 debate between C.J. Marshall of the Church of Christ and our brother, Desmond Robertson. We are picking up from verse 19 to the end of the chapter. We're going to see if the conclusion of this discussion can answer the question. Does Hebrews chapter 10 teach for or against eternal security? As always, we want to thank CJ for taking the time to speak with us, and of course, you the viewers for taking the time to spend with us. stand firm in the truth. Let us embrace the challenges that lie ahead. Let us emerge stronger and more steadfast in our faith. Welcome once again to the Knights of God live discussion. May our time together be blessed. May we continue to grow in faith and fellowship. You're not spreading the gospel correctly by telling people to just believe in Jesus and trust in his finished work on the cross to enter into heaven. That's a lie, and I don't support your ministry in giving people false expectations. Our two brothers in Christ, Brother Desmond and Brother Crawford, will defend the truth of the matter and dispel the fiery darts of the wicked one who wishes to cause us to doubt our Lord. in the beginning. I, I was very much passionate without any knowledge, <laughs> zealous without any direction. And so I remember having what people would describe as an evangelistic heart. Tonight we're talking about Kingdom in Context, a cult that has been growing in popularity online. They've got all kinds of strange beliefs, and many of them are contrary to the biblical and historical Christian faith. We'll be looking at the background of Sean Griffin, discussing his view on God, Jesus, the Word of God, and the Gospel, and how his beliefs are counterintuitive to the Scriptures. Hey guys, Desmi here, and thank you for watching the live stream tonight. We will start in about another minute. Um, just wanted to say this really quick. Uh, please take the time to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. It helps us greatly, and on top of that, we like to engage with our viewers. If you have something to comment on, if you have a disagreement, if you have an agreement, whatever it may be, please let us know. Uh, also, we have more stuff coming out pretty soon, so stay tuned and watch. Uh, again, just want to say thank you guys and enjoy the live stream tonight. And here's one more infomercial. Enjoy. Excuse me for interrupting, but I wanted to invite you to download our free online booklet, Show Me, Christian Answers to Mormon Evangelism. It contained basic information of the Mormon faith and biblical answers to those beliefs that you will need to know when you meet their missionaries. This short but comprehensive booklet ranges from the first vision of Joseph Smith to the tritheistic view of the Godhead and much more. We will also have one soon for the Jehovah's Witnesses and much more soon to be available. You can find this and more on our website www.thekogministry.org. Again that is www.thekogministry.org. But until then, thank you for your time, and enjoy tonight's stream. So if you guys haven't seen it, we did um, 
the first part of the debate on CJ's channel on Theology Matters. And then after this discussion, I'll go ahead and have his uh, channel linked in the description below. It won't be there right now, but we'll be there after the debate. And uh, Ed, he'll be our moderator. He's a very, very good moderator. I always love to have him here. And uh, yeah, and we're going to pick up where we left off at, at verse 16, I believe. Is that right? Or is it verse 19? I forgot. I have verse 19 marked. It's verse 19. Yep. Yep. All right. And so Ed, since Ed is our moderator, you want to give the rules and that sort of thing? Okay, uh, we're going to change the format up just a little bit tonight. And what we're going to do is allow each to present their um, exegesis for about seven minutes. And then we'll have a more free exchange afterwards. Last week, it seemed like we were tripping over each other, what we were going to say, what we wanted to say, what we wanted to save. And so this will give both of them the opportunity to present their message and then to have that free flow of exchange. Uh, after we work through the first section, which would be verses 19 through 29, uh, we'll do the same thing, verses 30 through 39. And then after that, we'll have about 15 minutes for question and answers, and then uh, five minutes each for summation. Sounds good. All right. And uh, who went first last time? I, I don't recall. Uh, was it me or CJ? I, I was CJ first. Um, so, so maybe let's switch it up. You, uh, you can, you can go first tonight. Uh, okay. And what we also decided to do this time was to, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read the passage first, so you guys aren't spending your time rereading everything, and that'll take away or or give you both a little bit extra time there. Is that all right? That's perfect. Okay. Um, are we ready to start? Yes, sir. I'll also share that as well so that way everyone else can see it. That might be too small. So let me do this instead here. There we go. Okay. And before I start reading, I want to lead us in a word of prayer, if that's okay. That's perfect. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the word that you've given to us through your spirit that we might understand more about Jesus Christ, that we might understand more about you and about your spirit and how you would have us to live. Help us to understand our salvation, Father, and help it to be clear to us that we might spend eternity in your presence. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. If anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? Okay. Desmond, are you ready? Yes, sir. I am ready. I'm about to reset this really quick. And sorry, I'm over here editing so many things here. Okay, I'm ready now. All right. Go ahead, brother. All right. Hey, and I just want to thank again uh, CJ for being here and having these discussions with me. I, I know we always have passion discussions, but just so you guys know, we're, we're actually pretty good friends behind the scenes, but not. These are just points of contention that we have when it comes to these particular scriptures. And, you know, as you, as you see in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, uh, we're trying to be Marines here to make sure the scriptures say what we're claiming that they say. So <clears throat> I encourage you guys to also do the same. Just grab your Bibles and just let go of those preconceived notions that we would have and just let the scripture speak for itself. And so 
here we're going to be looking at uh, verses 19 to uh, verses uh, 20, uh, 29. And from what we see here from last time, uh, CJ and I, we had a little, uh, uh, I guess you would say, uh, debate there on who is, he, who is uh, the writer actually speaking to. And here I can see where some of the confusion is going, uh, going, to, going to go to. Verse 19, where it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the uh, blood of Jesus, uh, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God. In other words, before uh, in the Old Testament, we had the tabernacle, we had the place where it was the Holy of Holies, where the high priest can only enter. And no one else could actually have that uh, contact with God, only the high priest could. Now that Christ came in, providing the, the better and new covenant, uh, we are able to have uh, the ability to actually go before God uh, with boldness and not have that, that fear of being struck down or anything like that because we're covered by the blood of Christ. And thank Jesus for that, uh, that we're able to have that personal relationship with him and that he is our mediator as opposed to just any other man. Uh, let me go a little bit further down here. <clears throat> let us draw near to uh, with a true heart, with full assurance, having our uh, hearts sprinkled with, uh, from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. All right, so this is a uh, harkening back to Ezekiel chapter 30, 36, if I recall, 36 or 37, where it talks about a uh, guy who was saying, I will sprinkle your heart with, uh, with clean water. And this is something that is talking about a spiritual thing. It's not talking about water baptism or anything like that, but it's talking about how God's going to uh, purify us with his blood, wash us clean. And that way we're not, we're, we're not seen with sin, we're seen with Christ. You know, he doesn't see us anymore. He sees Christ who lives within us once we, of course, believe in his gospel message. Um, and because of that we're able to lay hold on that hope that he gives us through the cross, through through what he has done on the cross. Again, this is all about what he has done for us, not about what we have done for him. And in terms of eternal security, let's keep on going down just a little bit more. Verse 26 is the, going to be the main verse we're really going to be hitting at. Um, for if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a certain a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Now, this is talking about rejection. And the reason why we know that is by the following verse. But first, let me just kind of talk about this a little more. Those who hear the gospel and then reject it, right? Those people are going to, well, they, they're going to realize it's true. And then, of course, they're going to walk away from it. We've seen cases of that. For example, in John chapter 6, there were disciples of Jesus. And they only believed him as far as like say, okay, well, he's a prophet. They didn't believe that he was a son of the living God, like Peter and the other uh, the other eleven did. Um, this is talking about uh, people who heard the gospel and have willfully rejected. And I was looking at verse twenty eight really quick, just to kind of uh, send out point back home. Verse twenty eight says, anyone who has rejected Moses uh, Moses law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God on the foot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing? Now the thing, or sorry, uh, he sanctified a common thing, insulted uh, the uh, spirit of grace, right? So this is a person who has rejected the gospel, rejected the Holy Spirit, rejected what you know what Christ has done. You think about. I'm going to bring a scripture out real quick. First John chapter two, verse two, where it tells us that, um, or sorry, verse one, uh, where it tells that he's propitiation, not for only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Their debt has been paid. All you have to do is believe in it. But however, if you don't believe in that gospel, then you can't, you can't read the benefits of what, what he's done for us. Um, it was like, we're in a cage. So that door has been open. He's like, well, you can come on out. Those people refuse to go out, so they have to suffer their own consequences. So again, these people here are willfully rejecting the gospel, willfully rejecting what the Holy, or what Christ is doing on the cross, willfully rejecting the Holy Spirit to live within them and, of course, seal them into their redemption. But uh, how much time do I have? Uh, it, oh, you're muted. You have two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay. Um, I think with that, I can just go ahead and, and see the rest of my time. I'll let CJ take over. Okay, CJ, are you ready to go? Yep. So, so what we heard from Desmond is that this section is about an unbelieving hue. Is there a way you could uh, leave the Bible on uh, for everybody to 
and follow along. Uh, there we go. So, the, the book of Hebrews is all about uh, warning Christians to not go back to Judaism. That was the whole thing. For example, in Hebrews chapter 2, we read this. Hebrews, Hebrews 2, sorry, he says this, verse 1, therefore we must pay Therefore, we must pay closely attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. Hebrews 2 and 1 says that you can drift away from the message. Now, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression and disobedience received the just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. How shall we escape the judgment of God if we neglect the salvation that was preached through angels and, and God bore witness of this. Now, he, he starts chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling. He, he, here's the audience of the book. Though holy brothers, those who share in the heavenly calling, establishing a, a the, I'm doing all this to establish the context of who he's writing to. Desmond told us last week he's writing to a general audience with uh, professed believers and unbelievers. But he says in chapter 3, I'm writing to partakers of the Whole partakers of the heavenly calling. How, how much time do I have? You still have about five minutes, CJ. All right. Now, now we go back to Hebrews ten. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places. By the blood of Jesus. This is the same people he he warned in chapter 2 not to fall away. This is the same people he's writing to who are partakers of the heavenly calling. Notice what they have. Boldness to enter to the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Here's where I'm going to impress Desmond tonight. Who is the we? He is not talking about just himself. It is a we. And so is him and his audience. Uh, is him and his audience have this boldness or just him? Well, why, why does he use we? Verse 21, they have a high priest over the house of God. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Uh, verse 23, they have a confession of hope. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. The Hebrew writer is wanting to Nail this down that he's sharing something with his audience. 
He doesn't share something with professed believers. He he shares something with Holy Brethren, chapter 3. Now, uh, all these blessings, a confession, high priest, the, the same audience is under consideration in verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Desmond said that this this is an unbeliever hearing the gospel and rejecting it. But that would make the Hebrew writer an unbeliever because he says again, if we go on sinning willfully, but a fearful expectation of judgment. Uh, what was the time at? You, you muted. Sorry. Down to two minutes, CJ. Okay. So, so verse 27 to 29. If we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, him and his audience, uh, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Notice the word no longer. If I'm no longer a smoker, that implies I was a smoker. If there's no longer a sacrifice, because I've gone back to the law of Moses, there was a sacrifice. Verse 29. Uh, he talks about those who died without punishment under the testimony of two or three witnesses under Moses' of law. In verse 29, he says, How much worse punishment will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. These are sanctified people and outrage the spirit of grace. Can you outrage the spirit of grace without being saved? I don't think so. Okay, CJ, your time is up. All right. So this is the period where we enter into sort of a back and forth. I'll do my best to try and uh, pay attention to the debate uh, format rather than the points that are being made so I can make sure everybody gets equal say here. Um, but I think since CJ finished, we'll let uh, Desmond go first on that. Okay. All right. Uh, so so basically, I'm just this is cross-examination, right? Just make sure I got that yeah. right. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's go to the part of, uh, of contention, the one that we're really just, <laughs> cause I don't, I don't think verse 19 on down, we're going to have too much of an issue with that. Um, obviously Jesus is the reason why we're able to, uh, approach, uh, the father with boldness, whatnot, or the, thro the throne of great or the, thro the throne of boldness. But verse 26, it says, for if we've sinned willfully after we received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no sacrifice of, uh, remains a sacrifice for sins. Can you define that a little bit more, CJ? What does that mean? Sure. Uh, in the context of the book of the Hebrews, what the Hebrew writer is referring to, if, if you sin willfully and going, going back into the law of Moses, there is no longer a sacrifice be, because the sacrifice is in Christ. Right. So basically what you're saying, you're just going back to, uh, to what I said earlier, the context where uh, there's no longer the sacrifice of bulls and goats. The ultimate sacrifice is Christ. So they can't go back and just do those that's, things again. That's right. Hebrews, okay. Hebrews 10, one. Okay, good. All right, we're, we're, we're in alignment right there. Uh, okay, so I guess the issue really is going to be for if we sin willfully after we receive knowledge of the truth, for you, you would think it's a, uh, uh, a an actual believer who understands the gospel and then just rejects it. Is that correct? 
Oh, uh, that, that's exactly right. And, and uh, I would, uh, I would challenge the statement wiggy. Uh, if that is the believer who's not saved, rejecting the gospel, then that means the Hebrew writer will be uh, an unbelieving Jew also. Be, because he includes himself in this we. Okay. And it's a, I guess it's a free flowing discussion, so you can ask me questions too, though. So <laughs> that's all right. So, the, so in, in verse 19, mm -hmm. the 22, are, are these marks of a Christian? Therefore, yes, these are definitely marks of those who uh, have genuine faith in Christ. So, so these are blessings for a Christian, right? No, no doubt. So, so we, we have the phrases, brethren, let us, let us, let us. Those are all Christians are all through verse 25, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, at least professed believers, that's correct. Well, well, professed believers don't have boldness to enter in, into the body. Professed believers don't have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Because... Uh, the, the believer who is just professing really doesn't have that blessing in verse 19, right? I, I, think the, I think the real issue is understanding what I mean by professed. And what I, what I mean by that, like you as well, you profess to be a Christian. But us as the, the people on the outside, we don't have no genuine insight into the contents of CJ's heart. Likewise, with the writer of uh, Hebrews, he doesn't have the insight of everyone who professes to be a believer. So he's addressing them as believers, not knowing the content of their heart. That goes that that's left to God. In a previous discussion, I also less, I listed like four verses that stated that only God knows the heart of men, not not the apostles, not the prophets, etc. So in this in this material context, he's just talking to those who who say they're believers, profess believers, in other words, is speaking to them as brothers, not stating the, the issue is not whether or not they're true believers or false believers. But the issue is what do a believer have? What does a true believer have in Christ? So, so let me get this straight. Regardless of if these are true believers or not, he is taught. He is talking about blessings of being a true believer in Christ. Right, he's, yeah, exactly. He's talking about those true blessings of a true believer, but the audience he's speaking to, though these are just, we don't know the content of their heart. This, that, that's basically what I was saying before, that he doesn't have the insight into their heart to know if they're truly believers or not. He's just telling them what a true believer actually has. So, so if, if I grant you that, and he's not talking specifically to Christians in Hebrews, and there's this Hypothetical character. He's, he's speaking to Christians. I'm not saying he's not speaking to Christians. Okay. Yeah. So, so the so if we verse 26, the does the, the we include the Hebrew writer? Yeah, all, he's he's talking about everyone here, everyone in his audience. Is not when I say like for example, um, if we commit adultery, right? Uh, if I if we go out to a store, I'm not saying that I'm going to go ahead and do these things. I'm just you, I'm just speaking as a general we. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's speak about himself uh, in this particular context. We'll actually see that later on in the chapter as well. Well, well then, then, then well, uh, I don't want to take over too too long, so, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, that's fine, because uh, I think we're going <laughs> we're going to keep going back to that anyway. But in, in verse, so let, let's let's stick to that really quick. Uh, verse twenty six. How do you relate verse twenty six to verse twenty eight? Because verse twenty eight is the example that we have for verse twenty six. How do you relate those two verses? Well, verse twenty nine. He he he's making the comparison between the law of Moses. And just how much worse it is to reject Jesus 
when we become when we've entered into a covenant with Lord. So it was bad under the Old Testament. How much worse then if you've been sanctified by Jesus, if you fall away back into Moses' covenant, how much worse? Okay, so for the, in verse 28, it says, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy. So uh, is he saying that the person who rejected Moses' law was previously an, an adherent to Moses' law? Is that what he's saying in this verse here? Well, he, he's just making a statement about those who would have broken Moses' law, that they would have died without mercy. I, I, think, the, I, think, the difference, I think the difference between you and the writer here is the word choice here, because you said those who have broken Moses' law. That can apply to anyone, but someone who has rejected Moses' law is different. Someone who says, I'm not going to follow that. There, there's an example that uh, they're called antinomians. They completely reject Moses' law, and they actually existed during the time of the writing of this uh, of this book here. They completely rejected the law of Moses and said that has nothing to do with us as believers. So for so the difference, the difference here, this is what I'm trying to understand here. There, the Hebrew writer in context is talking about someone who's never who doesn't adhere to Moses' law at all, not someone who's broken his law. There's a difference there, if you understand well, what I'm saying. Well, well, actually, verse 28 says, set aside the law of Moses. I'm sorry, say it one more time. Now, verse 28, those who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So the idea is, the, the idea seems to be that I'm a Jew under the law of Moses, and I set that aside. And he's making a comparison between that leaving Judaism and how much worse then is it to leave Judaism it's bad enough to leave Judaism once you're part of it. How much worse then is it to go go, go back to Judaism? Verse 29. I, respectfully, I think you're divorcing verse 29 from verse 28. Because the point is, those who reject Moses' law died on the testimony two or three witnesses, uh, how much worse so if you reject Jesus who sanctified you at the end of verse 29? And, um, so you're making, well, this goes back to the point of like, you're assuming that these are true believers that are rejecting, even though the text itself doesn't necessarily state that. All we know that these are Christians that he's writing to. We don't know if they're a state of their salvation. Say that. It, it, it does, but by you, you already agreed he is talking to true believers. No, I say he's talking to Christians, professed he, believers. He, he, so if you're a Christian, you're saved. I'll, I'll use an example really quick. Um, I'm going to have to go outside the text real quick. But Matthew chapter 7 it says, uh, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have I not done many mighty, mighty works in your name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are people out there, and I think you would agree with this too, who claim to be professed Christians. They say, I, you know, I read the Bible, I go to church, I do this, I do that. I do all these things in the name of Jesus. But yet they never actually knew Jesus. These are people who are professing belief, but they never had genuine faith in Christ. As Christ says, you know, be gone with me, a new worker of iniquity. I would say here in this particular context in, in Hebrews chapter 10, He's just, he's just telling them the marks of a true believer. He's telling them what a believer has in Christ, but he's not making a distinction between what, if a person is a true believer or a false believer in his audience. That's not the point of the context here. Well, well, I would argue that's not one of the texts. He, he's clearly talking about those who have the blessing of having a high priest over the house of God, can you demonstrate what you're saying in the text itself? Please. Yeah, so like, so for example, uh, let me go here really quick. Well, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to skip to towards uh, the end of the chapter, unfortunately. But I'm not trying to do that right now because we're sticking okay. to uh, 19. No, no, I, I'm a, I'm a, 
I want to stick to the what, what we're reading here. Uh, that's the only thing I hate about this because I, I can't go beyond it just yet. But um, yeah. but here, but here he's. If you look at in this text here, there's nowhere here where he's actually saying that this person is a true believer. This is per no. He's he's, he's a general. It's a general we, and I'm gonna show that towards the end of the text. I can't actually show that just with the verses we have right here. Unfortunately, okay. I have to go towards can the end you, of the text. Can Can you go down and and show that for me, please? And uh, pass the text we already read. Yeah. Uh, just uh, but because I, I really don't see anything that suggests a general we there's been wouldn't it make much more sense than in your view if the Hebrew writer says if you go on sinning will deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice to sin. Well, Doesn't answer, that make the Hebrew writer's point better? No. So I'm going to show you really quick. So that word there where it says reject or it says to set aside, uh, that word there is a theo. And that word means to annul, make no effect, ignore, to slight, break faith with. So this is a person who has ignored the gospel, who has rejected the gospel. Uh, someone who has, you know, they say, okay, I believe I believe in Jesus, but yet they go on and sinning. This is a person who's not a true believer. And I've used another text as well uh, outside of this, which will also state that, and this is in First John, that those who practice sinning is not of God, but they're rather of the devil. They they never were of God. So this is the point. This is the, this is the point that the Hebrew writer is making: is that someone who says I believe in Jesus, but yet they go on sinning. There's no help. There's nothing more that can be done for them. Well, they either come. They either come to faith in Christ. They either come to faith in Christ, or they just go on into eternal damnation. See, that that's what you believe, but that's not in the in the Hebrews ten because well, he says let us. And what we because in the fictitious distinction between the, the true believers and false believers, when they it's not in the text, Desmond. Because you're making the assumption that we refers to all true believers, which we don't see in the text at all. All no. we see there, all we see there, he's talking about marks of a true believer. He's talking about what they have. He's talking to an audience. Who may contribute? Who, who, which contains true believers, and may have false or false beliefs. You can't, hold on, hold on. You can't, you can't show me in the text where he's talking just purely just true believers. Like, hey, I'm just talking to you, true believers, right here. This is what you have, and this is what you can lose. That's not what the author does. So he, do false believers have? have can, do false believers have all the blessings in 19 through 23? Again, this goes back to what I said before. He's not, that's not the point of the text here. He's not making a distinction between a true believer and a false believer. Hold on, hold on, let me, let me finish. Let me finish. He's not making a distinction between a true believer or a false believer in this text. He's talking about a mark of a true believer. He's speaking to an audience who all profess Christ. So this would apply to them if they truly believe in that. Yes. Eddie, you, you're muted. You're still muted. Yeah, well, you're no, you're unmuted. I, I just can't hear you. Oh, uh, maybe there's an audio bug. Can you guys hear me? There yeah. we go. Okay, something's funky with my microphone. Anyway, um, you you both have acknowledged that you probably need to go through the rest of the chapter to finish making your points. So yeah, exactly. let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do that now. Um, and are we going to keep the same format with Desmond going first again for this section or CJ first? We can, we can switch it up now since I went first originally. Well, well uh, last time I went first twice. So if you, Did you? If you want to go first twice, that'll be fair. Oh, okay. That's fine. Too. <laughs> That's fine too then. Uh, let me pull this back up again. And... I'll start my and so we're back time. down to starting seven minutes. All yep. right. Okay. And I'm going before we start that, I'm going to finish reading the, the section here. Okay. This is the new, new King James picking up in verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the th will of the God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. All right. And I will just go back up just a little bit here. So we've we've all heard uh, what CJ was just talking about. And I'm just going to go just a little bit further up because um, this was a, like a key text that we had contention on for if we sin willfully. Uh, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a, a, a sacrifice of sins, but a certain uh, fearful expectation of judgment and fearful or sorry, and fiery indignation, which will devour those adversaries. This is very crucial to understand the rest of this here. Uh, so like I was stating, the, the we that he was talking about is just you know, we. There's nothing in this text that's about believers is in Christ. You need to know. Now, whether they're a true believer or not, we'll see. And God knows who's going to be said, but we'll see by their endurance. Um, those who reject the gospel, obviously, uh, Revelation chapter 20 is that all unbelievers have their place in the lake of fire. Uh, this is this is consistent with what the text is saying here. Uh, it says that the Lord will judge his people. Again, was was it referring back to, if we look at that text, it's going back to Deut Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 36. I'm not going to read that now, but obviously this is talking about the people of Israel. And of course, those in this particular context, it's talking about those who, uh, who believe in Yeshua here. So again, the context is Jewish believers, those who profess belief in Christ. And we know from, like, for example, the book of John, there are Pharisees who, quote, unquote, believed. There were disciples who, quote, unquote, believed, but they walked away from Christ because they didn't have genuine belief in Christ. How do we know that? John chapter 6, for example, tells us that they only believed that he was a prophet. Unlike Peter and the, the other 11 who say that he is the son of the living God, he is the Christ. This is the distinction between true believers in Christ versus those who are not. They only believe to a certain point, And of course, they didn't have genuine belief in who he really is. And of course, if you don't believe he's the son of God, you cannot be saved. So those weren't true uh, disciples. But going back to this text here. Um, he's talking about what these Hebrews have went through. It says, but recall the former days after you uh, were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly because you were made a spectacle by both uh, reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. And for you had compassion on me and my chains. So these are people who had, and this is what makes me think this is the, the writer is actually Paul. It, it, it just, it, the writing style kind of reminds me of what Paul would say, especially when he says that you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods this is something that Paul actually wrote about quite a bit in Acts uh, and other uh, and other books as well. So, and again, I could be wrong on that for sure. Um, but let's go, let, let's look down just a little bit here, 37 to 39. This is really, really crucial, right? And remember I said about the general we earlier, he's not making the distinction between who's false and who's true here, but he does here. Verse 37, for yet a little while, and he who is coming uh, will come and will not tarry, talking about Christ coming back. But now the just shall live by faith, but anyone draws back. My soul has no pleasure in him. Again, this is a, I'm just going to read this here. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. These are texts that talks about uh, living by faith. They're not talking about their works or anything like that. You will know that they're true believers by the faith that they, uh, that they live out here. But in verse 39, he has complete assurance. This is a distinction. This is actually... What brings me to eternal security versus those who don't. It says, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. How can he know that? That's the real question. How can he know that, you know, we are not those who draw back in perdition? If that warning in verse 27 was to true believers, then this doesn't make any sense. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, we know that when you believe in Christ, you are then saved, of course, 
um, it says in Ephesians chapter one, verse 13 and 14, that uh, that we will be redeemed at the day of redemption. Right. There's no timeline that says, oh, if you or conditions, so if you stop believing, that's not what the writer is even focusing on. If you can stop believing, he doesn't make, make any mention of us. But rather, he says we are those who believe to the saving of the soul, eternal security. Right. Uh, why do we why do they even believe in Christ? Again, they believe in the gospel and the way he's done for him. But there again, there's nothing here that talks about, oh, you know, we can stop believing or we can um, uh, or, the, or for, for example, verse 26, if we sin willfully after we have received knowledge of the truth. Well, if they sin willfully, verse 39 doesn't matter, doesn't matter at all. It says we are of those who do not draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. There's a reason why he knows this is because he's eternally secure in Christ and what Christ has done for him. Um, again, there's a distinction between there's just the we talking about, oh, those who, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, I can't even think right now. If we if we send well, for, again, that's a general we. Uh, again, this is talking about those who have rejected the gospel. This isn't talking about someone who's accepted the gospel. There's a difference that we have received the knowledge of the truth. There is no longer remains a sacrifice of sins. This is also compounded by what it says in verse 28, where it says anyone who has rejected the Moses, uh, Moses law dies without mercy. Someone who has rejected the law say, I'm not going to follow that. Again, look at that Greek word there. It's talking about someone who ignores his law, those who don't live by that, right? Someone who has rejected that. That's a distinction from somebody who is uh, who has broken law because, again, we have all broken law. Uh, James chapter uh, uh, 1 talks about that. We have all broken law at some point. If you break one, you break them all. It's not talking about that. But rather, someone who has completely rejected his law and decided to live his own way, they will die without mercy because they have rejected the law of God. Likewise, when it comes to the gospel of Christ, someone who has um, uh, rejected the gospel of Christ will not have that sacrifice for their sins. There's no hope for them. So now going all the way back down here, he tells them, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Again, there's hope in Christ. There is there is assurance in Christ. Your, your assurance is not in what you do, but when it, what Christ has done for you. This, this is what uh, the writer has repeatedly stated. Now, how much time do I have? Sorry about that. Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Well, I'll go ahead and concede that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so CJ, are you ready to? I'm do ready. Your part? Okay, timer started. So we keep hearing this distinction between a general we and a specific we, and, and friends, that's not in the text. He he's talking about. Uh, he, he's talking to the brothers, verse 19, those who have confidence to enter to the, into the holy places by the blood of Jesus. This isn't talking about just professed believers. Yes, Desmond says they include the same, but it also includes somebody who just believes and is a false professor. Well, they don't have confidence to enter into the blood of Jesus. This would disqualify disqualify this fictitious guy who is a false believer. He is not talking about that in verse 19. But by the way, false believers are not brothers. Brothers, we have confidence. He is talking to those who have the confidence. Desmond has to prove his assertion from the text that there is this other category of people he is talking about. Now, verse Verse 32. But recall the former days after you were enlightened. Were, were just professed believers enlightened? But were, were professed believers enlightened? No. You were enlightened after you were uh, enlightened. You endured hard struggle with suffering. 
sometimes being publicly exposed to approach an uh, affliction talk, and he starts listing all of the attributes of uh, those Christians there. Verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Why? Well, why don't throw away your confidence? Do just, do just, do general believers have a confidence of salvation? No, friends. Doesn't again is making this fictitious distinction between professed believers and, and including Christians, and he has to do that because, uh, be, because of what the text says. Well, look at verse thirty-eight. Verse thirty-one seven. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, shrink back from what? From faith. My soul has no pleasure in him. Now, verse 39 was hammered by Desmond. But we are not of those who, who, who shrink back and are destroyed. Why? Because... Because we have faith and preserve our souls. What if you don't have faith? Verse 26 through 29. Look at verse 29 again. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and proclaimed profane the, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. This man in verse 29 was sanctified, and he says, look, if the law of Moses is bad, how much worse punishment do you think will, will be had for those who are sanctified and obeys the spirit of grace? What's my time? You have two minutes. Two minutes, all right. So, so how how do you outrage the spirit of gra grace? What does that mean to Paul? What does that, if the writer of Hebrews is Paul, which uh, I don't I don't think so, but let's take advantage of if it is Paul. Uh, in Ephesians 4.30, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you were sealed. You can grieve the Spirit. You can insult the Spirit of grace. If you insult the Spirit of grace, you insult the one who saved you, the, the one who seals you, because in Paul's language, that, that's the Spirit there's the spirit's role of salvation. Uh, One minute. Yeah, I'm going to con conceive that. Okay. So we're getting getting down to the nitty-gritty. I just want to encourage both of you to uh, let each other finish uh, your points, but keep your points concise. Uh, if you ask a question, let's keep the answer fairly concise so that we can get it back and forth going and we don't have somebody monopolizing one side or the other. I, I was trying not to. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard. That's, that's not an, CJ, I'm not making an accusation. I'm just stating the facts here. So let's keep it, yeah. keep it uh, even and back and forth. Yeah. So mm -hmm. since Desmond started last time, do you think it would be fair if I started? I'm okay with that. Go ahead. Okay, so well, let's look at verse 38. Mm -hmm. But if my righteous one to live by faith, excuse me, but my righteous one to live by faith, and if he shrinks back, shrinks back from what? 
talking about uh, the uh, the faith. So, so if you shrink back from faith, my soul has no pleasure in him. Right. Isn't that my position? No. So the issue is is there's a lot of assumptions here. So, for example, in this text here. If someone doesn't have faith in Christ, they can't reap the benefits of this. So if they don't believe the gospel, this, this, there's, there's no pleasure in their soul. So you're, you're thinking, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you're thinking that this is a person who's already saved, who had faith, and then just lost their faith. The issue here doesn't say that here. It's talking about someone who has shrunk away from it. They don't, they, I'm good. I don't want it. There's a difference between saying someone who has rejected, which is consistent with verses 28 to 28, uh, sorry, 26 to 28, versus somebody who lived in it and then left it. it okay, let's, it, let's let oh, CJ sorry. answer that Go point. Yeah, my fault. But isn't the point to say that he was living by faith per the context of verse 38, that, that, that first clause there, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, uh, my soul has no pleasure in him. Isn't he talking about the one living by faith, not just having faith? Let's take a look at that really quick. Because my in a new well in the New King James version it says uh, anyone, so it doesn't talk about specifically the person who you know. Which word is he? I already showed you that. Hold on, let's see here. No, that's not what it says here. Hold on one second here. Uh, here we go. Yeah, so that, so yeah, what it actually says, if we're just going to keep it to the Greek, it just means to uh, to draw in, to let down, draw back, uh, keep back, shun, or conceal. So it doesn't well, specifically, by, there's no pronoun there at all. Uh, by the context, the, the pronoun would be going back to the righteous one, verse 38. No, so it says now. It says now the just shall live. To the 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 just man. Sorry. Yeah. So the just man. So anyone who draws back, anyone who draws back, are they just? No, because they're drawing back from faith. What does it mean to draw back? No, losing salvation. I don't know how how many how many times the Hebrew writer uh, needs to say it. No, so. Again, draw back doesn't mean losing salvation here. This is talking about someone who has shunned the faith, someone who who has never been believers in, in the beginning. With. So let me just show you really quick. If you so go there, that, and then yeah. I'm, I'm about to show you. Hold on. Okay. All right. So draw back, keep back, shun. Let me see if I can show you real quick. Uh, hold on one second. Stop sharing screen. Share screen real quick. There goes my cat. Get off. This, no, this is not the time. Get off. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, here we go. All right, to uh, withdraw, draw back, keep back, shun, conceal, uh, properly draw under, pulling back to retreat, go backwards, withdraw, shun, especially due to compromise. So if we're looking at the actual definition of this here, this is not talking about someone who has already been in the faith and all of a sudden they just want to leave. This is someone who is introduced to the gospel and they just don't have any faith in it. They uh, uh, back. They don't have nothing to do with it. They shun uh, it. They can steal uh, it. Actually, that's not the context this is found in. It's uh, it's referring to the righteous man, but, but you're making uh, an assumption. You're, you're making an assumption here because no, again, it's I'm not talking about. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, no, no, you're 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 you're, you're, you're stick. You're sticking with a particular translation. I'm showing you the actual Greek. The actual Greek doesn't no, refer to a particular person. No, listen, it doesn't. I'm, I'm showing you the Greek. You're going to deny the Greek. The Greek is showing us it's not talking about a particular person. It's talking about anyone. Translation argument, not a context argument. I'm making a contextual argument, but uh, why don't well, you ask me a question? If, if well. Yeah, let me let me because well, you asked me a question. Let me ask you a question real quick. Because yeah. on that on that line there, uh, it says, "Now the just shall live by faith." Okay, so you just said that, you know, uh, someone who doesn't have faith aren't just, right? So what does it mean to shun something, to conceal something? What does that mean? To, to, to despise it. Okay. So do, just, do the just despise what they've been given? 
Well, well, that's assuming your theology into the text. Mm -hmm. Verse thirty-eight says they do. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just, no, I'm just asking a question. I'm not going to assume anything. Mm -hmm. does, does it say anything about the just? Uh, does the just shun the gospel anywhere in the text? Yes, uh, verse thirty-eight does. Well, it just uh, says if it just says if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure. Well, and you just state, and you just stated well, someone who doesn't have. You just stated anyone who has faith. They don't uh anyone who doesn't have faith then you know there's no there's no pleasure they're not just so if they're not just then it's not talking about uh the just drawn back it's talking about anyone who has rejected the faith again going back to verse 26 uh, 28. I, I think you're reading your theology in the text my mind keeps it right there in the verse but but i'm not gonna capsulize let's move on to a different verse to your other question Oh, I just asked my question. You can ask a question. So, what would happen if, uh, if somebody would throw away their confidence? Verse thirty-five. Let's let's go back here. It says, "Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward." It says, uh, "For you, if you have need of uh, endurance." So that uh, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So it doesn't say what happens to someone who loses their confidence. It just says they have a great reward in their confidence. So, so what what is the reward uh, in, in light of verse thirty four? Isn't it the reward of the better possession and abiding one heaven contextually? So, so we're going back just a little bit. This is talking about them being persecuted, talking about they've endured a great struggle. So the, the writer, the writer here is encouraging those who have been persecuted here. He's telling them the endure, endure a little bit longer. Oh, this is verse uh, 32. Recall the former yeah, days after which you're who? Who's been persecuted? Talking about these believers here. The, those enlightened by the gospel, verse 32? Only believers have. Yeah. So, so, but, 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 but the point is that you're making this false distinction that the Hebrew writer doesn't, and saying these are true believers and false believers in the text. How, how, how false believers, professed believers, ever been enlightened yes or no so i think i said this about three or four times but yeah so a false believer can be enlightened to the uh, to the gospel being true that's not the issue someone can definitely say oh i believe in jesus i believe what he's done across me etc etc but they never put genuine faith in that so yes they can be enlightened to the truth but yet they can also reject it so once they reject this the the you know the truth of that is going to be a lot worse for them because they've known the truth and they walked away from it well uh I believe uh, the the enlightenment is connected to verse thirty four, having the abiding possession, having the possession of heaven. I'm sorry, uh, you said. I'm sorry, you said verse twenty thirty four. Or the, the same people who have been enlightened mm -hmm. are the same people who have, according to the Hebrew writer, present tense. A everlasting possession. Do do just professed believers actually have a abiding possession? Well, again, you're making the assumption. You like you were just saying. I'm reading this to the text. There's nowhere here there's that he's no, making. No, hold on, let me let me finish. He, there's nowhere in the text he's making a distinction between a true believer and a false believer in the audience. That's not the point here. He's talking about what a true believer has. He's talking about us because we're all we're all professors. He's not saying, okay, you're a true believer. You're, that, that's not the point he's making here. He's just simply saying what a true believer has. And if you're that believer, you're going to get these promises. But like you were saying here, you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So if, it, if this is true, I ask you a question here. Well, if they have a if they have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven, at what point does it not endure? Uh, well, the verse, uh, the verse thirty eight. If you if you swing back from faith. 
Well, again, you're making the assumption because here's the thing. No, I'm not. It, because I, I just showed, I just, I just. In the text. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You, you've also accused me of not doing it. I'm, I'm accusing you back here. So just let me go ahead and do this. <laughs> you can respond back. <laughs> but it says here, it says, now the judge shall live by faith. You just said earlier that the, um, that those who are who live by faith, those who are just, they they aren't the, they aren't the ones who draw back. It's just it says in verse thirty nine. It says we are not those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the same. So now, other question I have for you: Does it say believing or it says believe? Which one? Uh, well, the those who have faith. So if you don't have faith, uh, you you're not going to preserve your soul. That, so it says. That's the whole it says point. Text. It says, says who, who well, will... that, Hold on, you, I let you answer, let me answer. If you draw back from the faith of Jesus Christ, then, then you will not, you, you will not lose your soul. This is the whole context, man. But you're, you're, you're contradicting yourself. Verse 29 says, uh, again, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? But see, now I, I hear what you're saying there, but you're, but you're, you're also ignoring the, what he also said. He's talking about those who have rejected. Anyone who has rejected Moses' uh, law. Not, not, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's not talking about someone who has accepted Christ and all of a sudden they stop. Yes, no. He is. Talking, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Let me finish. 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 Let, no, read it within this context, like you just said. Anyone who has rejected. Hold on. Let me finish. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So this is, and I gave you the, the Greek here. This is talking about someone who has, who has. I don't want that. I'm not following Moses' law. I told you about the antinomians. We had that document as well. This is talk, also talked about in Revelation chapter 2, the Nicolaitans. These are also antinomians. These are people who purposely rejected. They never accepted. They never accepted the law of Moses. This is what it's talking about here. Someone, it says re verbatim, rejected Moses' law, and you ignore that. Verse 20, you, okay, you Desmond, Desmond, let CJ answer that point. Okay. No, it says set aside Moses' law. It doesn't say reject Moses' law, uh, at least ESV. Uh, I guess a new King James reject Moses' law. But, but the point is how much worse if you've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. There's no getting around 29. He clearly says he's profaned the blood of the covenant by which he that that's the man who's trampled on new foot the son of god was sanctified okay uh desmond let's answer that point please okay now really quick i, I hear you hammering that back home and you just kind of said well it says set aside but i showed you this really quick it does well, say reject desmond and, let's, let's let's not go back to that point let's answer the okay. point that cj just raised please yeah, yeah. So uh, those who uh, those who trample on who he was sanctified a common thing. So those, someone who has been set aside, some someone who uh, who uh, well they they've been illuminated. Uh, again, this is not talking about someone no, who has been saved. Just someone. This is somebody who has been sanctified by the blood of the covenant. He is not in the covenant of Moses. He is washed in the covenant made by blood in Jesus. This is not just somebody. This is the profane, the blood of the covenant. He is in me, the blood of the covenant. Okay, so, CG, let Desmond respond to that. So in response to that, it says, counted the blood of the covenant which is by which you sanctified a common thing. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus die for the whole world? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So they they have access to that blood, correct? Mm -hmm. If they believe the gospel. Yes, but not so what happens? So what? So what happens if they what happens if they reject that gospel? Let me answer, Let me answer that question. 
Okay. Closing. Jesus was given for the sins of everybody. Yes. But not everybody is benefiting by the blood of the covenant. This is the man who is in the blood of the covenant. He has a covenant with God. He's sanctified by the blood of Jesus. That's justification language. Now, what's your next question? Okay, so keeping it within that line, someone who has rejected. So are you saying that the person who is believing in Christ also can also reject Christ? Is that what you're saying? What do you mean by believe in Christ? What, what? They, believe, they, believe it, they, they believe the gospel. They believe, you know, the whole nine yards were not, and yet they can just later on reject him. Is that right? Is that what the text was saying? Well, well absolutely. The, the blood, he has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. False believers are not sanctified by the blood of Jesus. They're just so, not. So let me let me ask you a question. What happens? And then let's just say you meet someone on the street. Someone says they believe in Christ. They got baptized and that sort of thing. Are they sanctified? No, they're not sanctified by the blood of the covenant. No, because they're not in the covenant of blood. These are people who are in a covenant. I think it needs to flip here. What do yeah. you think? So oh. like. Was that was that my question or your question? Sorry. <laughs> Do, does it need to flip here, Ed? Um, are you talking about our time? No, uh, like, can I start questioning him? Or? Well, yeah, this is uh, back and forth. Uh, you, you can stay on this point, CJ, or you can move. Uh, what I don't want us to do is, is go in circles. I want answers that are, again, short and specific and not circular. Okay. So uh, I guess, CJ, it's your turn to... Well, okay. no, I, th I think you, you asked the one about sanctified by the blood. Did, Desmond, are did, you offended? Did, did yeah, I answer this? Sorry. There's so many questions back and forth. <laughs> uh, no, you're good. Get, get the last word on that, and then we'll get something else. So, yeah, uh, there's a, uh, a text, and I'll, I'll have it up right, right now, but in First Peter, it talks about those who uh, uh, who receive the knowledge of the truth. It says it's going to be worse from the second uh, when, they, when they go into judgment because they rejected it. So, again, that that language is being used by Peter. That language is also being used by this right here. I think it's also used by Jude. And it's talking about those who have uh, a profession of belief, but they never genuinely believed in Christ. And according to Jude, he talks about them being um, pretenders, being, uh, and we have to contend for the faith against them. So, unfortunately, I would have to go outside the text to actually show that, but um, that, I think that's part of the issue here. But, you know, looking at this here, uh, you said false believers though, cannot be sanctified. But again, I don't think the writer is trying to make the distinction like, okay, this is a true believer or a false believer within the you, you, You're right. You are. Uh, that's why I'm attacking it. He, he's not making the distinction. But you are. I've actually said like four times that he wasn't. I said, that's not the point. As so I, said, the issue, I, said, I said the audience, I said the audience will contain both those who are true and also uh, well, professing believers, whether it be true or false. I said that multiple times already. And then when it, can, when it comes to this text here, he's talking about the benefits of those who are truly believers in Christ. And of course, those who have known the gospel and rejected it, of course, it's going to be a lot worse for them. That's my whole point. Uh, I, think, I think what you need to do, what, what your position needs to do is go outside the text and hammer the audience. You're hammering that, that there are true and false believers in his audience. My, my point is, sure, grant that. The Hebrew writer is, I don't know how many, how many ways I can say this, he's writing about 
those who have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Maybe this is the clearest way I've said this between this discussion and last discussion. This is his audience. This is who he is writing about. So if you don't like the word audience, then writing about. But I have no further questions. So the main, the main issue here, the main issue here, I'm not sure. How much time do we have, by the way? Well, I think uh, we've uh, used up this 50. I forgot to set the clock. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, lo- lo- looking at our time on, on the live uh, stream, I think we've uh, probably used at least 15 minutes here. So we're, we're really entering the section for the question and answer. I'm not sure we've got a lot of questions um, coming in fresh. Um, what I see are several that go back quite a few minutes. Yeah, I'm going back now. There's not a whole lot today, it looks like. Uh, there's a lot more commentary more than anything. Oh, right, here we go. Well, here's the first question at 1918. Okay. They have the boldness to enter the blood of Jesus or enter by the blood of Jesus. That doesn't necessarily prove they have the boldness. The boldness is by the blood of Jesus. Have they accepted the blood of Jesus? Actually, they have. Read the the text again. We have boldness. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, by the blood of Jesus. That implies that they're in the covenant. He calls them brethren. He has this distinction with the we blows my mind. I asked Desmond to demonstrate that, and he didn't demonstrate it by the text. I mean, to be fair, we had other questions too that we just kind of went through and I didn't get a chance to, but I might have a chance to now just respond. <laughs> um, that distinction of the we, we, we can actually see that the difference between the general we and early in the text and also in verse 39, where it says, we are not of those who draw back from uh, back to perdition. What's the difference between him, the, uh, the, the, the truly saved, and those who, who draw back to perdition? They are true believers. They continue to believe in Christ. These other ones, they do not. They rejected the, uh, they rejected the Christ. They shrunk back. They shunned the gospel, as the um, as the Greek clearly lays out. It says shun. Doesn't say they. Oh, they just lost their salvation. That's not what it says. It says they shunned the gospel. So there is a difference between what CJ is saying, what the writer here is saying. Well, well, actually, what what the Hebrew writer, what what you needed to say is we we are those who shrink back, but we can't shrink back. Well, that's a that, that's that, that's really a lackadaisical statement. We, we, yeah, big whoop. We we have confidence. We have faith, but we but we can't ever shrink back. So, so that statement's kind of lackadaisical, meaningless according to your theology. In my theology, yeah. It works, but the new is it doesn't. Now there's a, another question here. Uh, this one's yeah. This one's directly to you, CJ. You want to take it? Yeah. Hold on. Where's all my peeps? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, they're, well, they're towards the end here. So I, I, I see Anna. She actually asked me a couple questions here too, though, okay. and also Matt. So I got a couple here. So, so Christians can't sin with boy. Do you believe in some of the factions, CJ? No, no, I don't. And the context of sinning willfully is willfully re- rejecting Jesus. See, these Christians, the, the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better. You Christians have Jesus. Because they were tempted to go back under the law, but but he's reminding those Christians, look how good you have it in Jesus. So so what what well, when it says sinning willfully, 
is talking about abandoning Christ and, and uh, going to a different law system. It's not talking about a sin that we, we commit uh, every day. First uh, John 1 8 says that if, if Christians say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. But the difference there is that the Christian walks in the light. These Christians are abandoning Christ. All right, so next one's going to be from me here. It says, what distinction does Desmond make between Christians and true believers? I don't think I was, man, I wasn't clear. But um, when it comes to Christians, we're, we're talking about anyone who has professing belief in Christ. We're talking about the wheat and the tares. Uh, we're talking about people who say, hey, I love Jesus. And, you know, those who truly li uh, who love Jesus and they also obey what he says. There's a distinction between true believers and false believers. Both profess uh, belief, but only one of them show that belief through their uh, through their faith uh, by their actions. Desmond, just to follow up on that. Uh, do you use the term Christian in a specific sense or do you use it in a generic cultural sense? Uh, it, dep it depends on the uh, context uh, of the conversation. So there are times where I just say Christians in general. So like I would say uh, Christianity is in a bad state. I'm not talking about true Christianity, but I would definitely say about the cultural Christianity is in a bad state, what we see in mainstream uh, media. But if I'm talking about true brethren, I'll, I'll be sure to say like, okay, true Christians or true brothers, whatnot. So there are times where I talk about the religion as a whole versus specifically the true, uh, the true faith of Christ. Okay, let me ask CJ the same question then. CJ, do you see a distinction between how you use the term Christian being cultural or specific? Yeah, uh, I think it's very specific, and I think the Hebrew writer is very specific in using his word brother to, to, the, to, to refer to those who have uh, the, those who have uh, faith, those who have all the blessings, excuse me, all, all the blessings of salvation. Uh, so, so, so I believe all the Bible writers use Christian brother in, in a very specific sense of those who are under the covenant of Jesus. Okay. And let me see, Anna had a couple questions here. Why did the writer use we instead of you, since he could only be sure of his own salvation, not those he was writing to? And this goes back to those verses I was using before where it talks about, well, the apostles, they say themselves, the prophets say themselves, they cannot know uh, the heart of man. So why does he use we again? I believe this is just more like a general we. Those who are true believers, they have these, uh, they have these promises, they have access to Christ, they, they can go before uh, God boldly, whatnot. Uh, again, he's not making, at least not in that particular uh, verse, so he's not making the distinction between true and true, uh, true and false believers. He's just simply saying, uh, we as believers, we have that access. Where you see the distinction is in verse 39, where he talks about we are not those who fall back in perdition. So they are the just ones. The ones who are not just are those who fall away, who fall into perdition. So I think the, the distinction is made by the writer towards the end. But uh, you can always see that through, through the context. So when he says there's a fictitious we, I think the we is actually shown in the context as, a, as opposed to uh, just something that was made up. Can I ever respond to that or no? Yeah. yeah. So, so it is fictitious because even in verse 39, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. Well, in Desmond's theology, of course you're not, because you can't do it. And, and uh, in Desmond's theology, the the, uh, the 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 end of verse 39, having faith and preserving the soul, you don't have. You you don't have to have faith to preserve the soul. Uh, so so. Uh, I mean, there's no preserving the soul. The Holy Spirit preserves it for you. Uh, I don't see any other uh, questions or answers, or questions rather. 
Um, I see several comments, but yeah. Um, well, it looks like one just came up here recently. In order for your salvation to be reversed, you would have to no longer be dead with Christ, perhaps undead or relived, realived. I think that's probably for CJ. That was actually for uh, Graham in the comment section, but I guess we can take it too, though. Well, well, uh, no, no the, the Bible writers doesn't talk in the unborn, undead. Uh, it, it talks in terms of casting away, uh, being, being disowned, being, being uh, fallen from the grace that saves you. And so you, you can change your state. Uh, and so but I would say that's not the Bible, Bible writer's language, but, but they do talk about Christians wandering off into error again and being lost, like in Hebrews 10. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess my response to that. Um, yeah, I, I would ask that question too, though. Um, I mean, for salvation to be reversed, um, I, I used I, I usually ask the question like, how do you commit spiritual suicide? Because that's basically what you're doing. Christ makes you alive in Him, and so for you to actually no longer be alive, you have to commit some sort of suicide, which you don't see anywhere in the text. Um, the casting away of faith, you know, it talks about the faith rather than, you know, no longer believing. There is a distinction between the faith and having a personal faith in Christ. Those distinctions are usually not made by those who are outside of once they've always saved for some reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, there there is a difference between like a doctrine instead of beliefs versus having trust in Christ. And those well, two I, distinctions are made within the text, though. Uh, I agree with, with that distinction. But you said uh, it doesn't talk about uh, it, it doesn't talk about that being dead, right? Uh, you you can't become dead. You you're right. Hebrews ten doesn't talk about it, but but James five nineteen and twenty does. But sorry, that that's not Hebrews. All right. I mean, he did. He did have a comment. You want to, if you want to read that, but that will start a whole dialogue between you two there. <laughs> uh, you might want. You might want to uh, do that, like a, a video on your channel, and answer some of those uh, or some of those statements, rather. Yeah, uh, I'm planning for those who care. Uh, I'm planning on re-uploading this to Theology Matters and. Next Thursday, I will have a review of both debates on the live program at uh, 6 p.m. And so if you want to be there, be there or be square. All right. Okay. Well, are you guys ready to give your five-minute summation? Yeah, that's fine. And CJ, you can go first this time. And and do we – do well – First of all, do we want five minutes or you just, uh, that's five minutes max? If you can say it in less, you just do it in less. Yeah, five, probably, five minutes. Okay. I probably won't need that much, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, Desmond, uh, you have been going first all night. So why don't we go ahead and let you go first on this and let CJ uh, have his final. Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and. I guess maximize my screen. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for just coming on. First, I want to thank CJ for uh, having this discussion with me and, of course, uh, Ed for mon um, monitoring us. I know we can be kind of rowdy, so, you know, he's real patient with us. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I also want to thank you guys, too, for just joining in and, and, you know, having good dialogue in the comments section. Long story short, when we're talking about eternal security, um, again, I can I can clearly say, you know, we are not those who draw back to perdition, but we all we believe to the saving of the soul. Once we believe in the gospel of Christ, we are saved. He seals us with the uh, Holy Spirit. We don't have no sort of worries because we have confidence in what, in what he has done. Our confidence comes from Christ, not our performance. Those who believe outside of eternal security, of course, they have to rely on their performance rather than what Christ has done for them. Like Christ... He saved you, but now you have to continue to do the work, which reminds me of what uh, the Mormons believe in 2 Nephi. Uh, when we look at um, 
Hebrews chapter 10, really quick, verse 26. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there is an assumption by CJ that this is a person who's been truly saved by Christ. But no, this is somebody who has heard the gospel. They, they think it's true or not. And we, we can also see this, for example, parable of the sword and other, and other uh, scriptures like that. Uh, but this is a person who has heard the gospel and then rejected that gospel. It's going to be a lot worse for them because they've rejected uh, the means of God's grace. They have stamped on their foot the 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 provision that Christ has done but for us by his blood. And then, of course, we look at verse 28, it makes it pretty clear. And CJ, he, he tried to change the word to the ESV, but the Greek is very clear on that. It's talking about anyone who has rejected, who has shunned, who has concealed, etc. as the uh, Greek actually says. Those who have rejected the Moses law or, uh, will, will die without mercy. Likewise, how much more worse will the punishment be for those who have uh, trampled, uh, trampled the Son of God underfoot? What does that mean to trample the Son of God underfoot? This means they know, they heard the gospel and they just reject it again. This is not somebody who has been saved. And they count the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified a common thing. Again, it says counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. He has set he he's set us apart, right? And those who believe in the God or who say, okay, the gospel is true, but yet they say, oh, I want nothing to do with Christ. There's gonna be a whole lot worse for them, right? This is not someone who has true faith in Christ. What is a marker of someone who has true faith in Christ? They continue to believe in Christ. They continue to be uh, sealed by the Holy Spirit. They continue to have that blood. They continue to be moved by the will of God. Um, again, these are all things we see within other, other scriptures that unfortunately we couldn't dive into tonight. Uh, but yeah, if you are a person who has heard the gospel and you reject it, it's going to be a whole lot more worse for you. For those of us, we have no worries. We have complete confidence in what God has already done for us. With that, I just want to thank you guys for joining us. And I'll go ahead and let CJ... Uh, Stay his uh, points. Can you bring him up, somebody? Yep. I got him. There we yep. go. Okay. All right. Can you tell me how uh, how I'm doing on time? Like, give me two minutes and then one minute, please. Uh, if you okay. <laughs> you Wait. Three, so you want three minutes? <laughs> well. well no, I want. I want. He wants a countdown at the end. Yeah. I got you. Oh, okay, okay. So, so we we've heard. By the way, Desmond keeps mi mischaracterizing my position by saying, "I." He says, "I believe in eternal security." Well, like CJ doesn't. What well, well, we? I, I reject his definition of internal security. Uh, he, 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 uh, I believe we're eternally secure in Christ. Uh, let, let me give a quick reference. Uh, as long as we have the turkey in the kitchen, we are sealed for all eternity. And so, if you know, you know. Uh, he he also said, "Look, he, he he again has this fictitious we in the text. If we go on sinning willfully, uh, deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins." He says, "These are unbelievers." Well, unbelievers don't have the blessings that the audience has in 19-24. And then to harp on verse 29 again. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who trampled underfoot the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. He was sanctified by the blood of the covenant, not just set apart for no purpose, sanctified by the blood of the covenant and insulted the spirit of grace. Look, uh, I don't know what Desmond needs the Hebrew writer to say. I don't know what language, what, what would convince Desmond, what, what language would the Hebrew writer have to employ other than to say, 
In verse 29, they, they, they trampled underfoot the Son of God and exalted the Spirit of grace by which he was sanctified. What other language would, uh, would, would does men accept? And the answer is, it doesn't matter how many words the Hebrew writer says the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It doesn't matter how many words, because he has Two this words. false doctrine to hold on to. It doesn't matter how many ways the Hebrew writer says, says it. Uh... Yeah, well, uh, I made my case. It'll stand. Uh, the audience can decide which case matched up with the text itself just a hammer. Verse 39. If we, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Desmond's theology, but we can never do that. Uh, but, but of those who have faith and preserve their soul. You heard it tonight. You can shrink back from faith and still be saved. That's my time. That's what I want to leave with. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, uh, I'm going to close this out here. You want to close out with a word of prayer yet? All right, and uh, appreciate those that have tuned in. Appreciate all the comments. A lot of those comments are coming here uh, a little bit late, but you guys have your own programs, and they'll give you some material to, to work on and, and to chew over. Uh, but again, I do appreciate the attitude um, when there are severe differences uh, that affect salvation. Uh, sometimes people get passionate, but it's always good to be able to discuss these things in a calm manner, and I appreciate that tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Almighty God and our Father, for the love that you've shown us. We thank you for the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for showing us the way that He is the way, the truth, and the light. And no one comes to Him except no one comes to you except by Him. And Father, as we study to learn more about Your will from Your Word, Father, we pray that we might set aside uh, our preconceived ideas and and to look with uh, intensity that will help us to see uh, the things that You have. Uh, spelled out for us, that we might uh, have a pure and honest heart, that we might be willing to confess when we've uh, been in error, that we might be able to repent and, and come closer to you, Father, because that is the goal that you have for all of us. You're not willing that any should perish, Father, and we thank you so much for the love that you've shown and the grace that you've given to make that possible. We ask that you would be with us as we depart from this meeting, and we pray, Father, that we might continue to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.